Are these slides going to be available? Well, I guess it's being recorded. It's being recorded. So, so, yeah. 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 so I have copies if anybody. Okay. Yeah, if anybody wants to grab one, that's up to them. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we're missing one of our panelists. Uh, for those of you who are joining us virtually uh, today, uh, you're nice and dry. Uh, today we are experiencing climate change here at the uh, U.S. Naval Academy. College Creek has overflowed its banks. Traffic is a disaster coming in through Gate 8. Um, so unfortunately, Dr. Brian is not here yet, um, but we expect her to join us at some point. So, so we'll just kind of let her join us when she arrives. We'll go ahead and get started. I am Commander B.J. Armstrong. I'll be chairing this morning's roundtable panel about conducting research on naval and maritime history here at the Naval Academy. This panel was organized as part of a new effort here at the Naval Academy called the Forum on Integrated Naval History and Sea Power Studies, or FINS for short. FINS is going to bring together naval historians, scholars, students from across the United States more widely and from around the world to stoke the continuing discussion of the study of naval history and the study of sea power and its relevance to both our past and our future here inside our walls at Annapolis. I've been asked by our department chair, Dr. Tom McCarthy, to lead this effort, serve as the principal associate of FINS. Um, Lieutenant Commander Chris Costello, who's also one of our officers here in the history department and an ABD historian at UC San Diego, He's one of our reservists with us. Um, he's going to serve as my managing associate in the FINS organization. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to announce a few more initiatives. These are going to include a joint lecture series that we put together with the Stockdale Center on Ethical Leadership uh, here at the Naval Academy. We're also going to launch a virtual workshop series for works in progress presentations, uh, both from scholars here in the United States and from the wider world to help develop our work as naval historians. This morning, however, we're here to talk about research. Uh, the grounds here at the Naval Academy are a tourist destination. They're a national park. Uh, and people often come here to see the physical side of our naval past. But for us naval historians, it's also a wealth of research opportunities here besides just viewing the monuments as we walk around the yard. There's a rich collection of archives and research uh, resources. And it offers our community wide opportunities for accessing both high quality secondary sources and also quite a lot of primary research opportunities here. So today I've brought together some representatives from the organizations on the yard that are the repositories of these materials to talk with us a little bit about what their collections offer and how to get access to them. I'm gonna introduce them all to you uh, at once here at the beginning. Uh, they'll give us a quick rundown on their collection, uh, what it contains, how it might be useful to you, as well as some tips and gouge on how to get access to it and how to use it. Uh, for our virtual folks, here's how we're going to handle question and answer after we get through all the presentations. Um, we'll have live questions from the audience that the OWL camera and, and system is going to pick up for us. For those folks who are attending virtually, if you have a question, please leave it in the Q&A feature on the Google Meet. The instructions you received from Vincent Clymer uh, should instruct you on how to do that. Once we get to the Q&A section, I'm going to ask Ensign Bierman, who's our computer tech wizard, he's got the con here for us today, to read off the text entered Q&A questions for us. So for the folks online, please leave yourselves muted um, and, and interact using that text mechanism. We think it's going to be the smoothest way to operate this. So we're going to go slightly out of order from the up. Oh, Jennifer made it. Hooray. Yeah, it's good you're going out of order. <laughs> <laughs> slightly out of order from the program. Um, we're going to begin today with Michael McCann. Michael currently serves as the history librarian at the U.S. Naval Academy's Nimitz Library, where he's worked in the research and instruction department since 2002. Michael received his BA in American Studies and his MLS both from Rutgers University. As a history librarian, he works extensively with midshipmen, faculty, and staff, but also assists researchers from outside the Naval Academy community, 
with inquiries related to Nimitz Library's collection and publicly available resources. Second, we're going to hear from Dr. For Jennifer, Dr. Jennifer Bryan, who graduated from Whiteford and received the Whiteford History Medal from Loyola University, of Maryland, where she was a history major. She received an MA from the College of William and Mary and graduated from the college's Colonial Williamsburg's jointly sponsored program on museum management. She received her PhD in American history from the University of Maryland. Her dissertation was on the Tillmans of Maryland's Eastern Shore, 1660 to 1793. She's worked as an archivist, as a curator, as a collection director since 1991, and she's currently the head of special collections and archives here at the Na Nimitz Library at the Naval Academy. Third, we're going to hear from Sarah McGlone, who is happy to be the current managing director of the Naval Academy Museum. She came to us from the Navy Museums Division at Naval History and Heritage Command and has degrees in art history and museum studies. Sarah grew up in Minnesota, but now resides in Edgewater, Maryland, where she lives with her husband and two teenage daughters. And finally, we're going to hear from Janice Jorgensen, who is director of the Heritage Group and archivist at the U.S. Naval Institute. A graduate of Springfield College and retired commander in the U.S. Naval Reserve, in addition to being responsible for answering research questions at the Institute, she's led the Naval Institute's efforts to digitize all of the holdings of proceedings in Naval history, as well as the extensive USNI image collection and the oral history project. So we'll go in that order, and then after the presentation, we'll open up for a discussion for Q&A from the audience, both live and virtual. Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Commander Armstrong. Good morning and uh, welcome to all of you to the Naval Academy. I'm going to start just by thanking uh, BJ for um, first for coming up with the idea for this panel, which I think was was excellent uh, idea, and second for inviting me uh, and, and the other folks to be a part of it. I'm as excited as you are to hear all about um, what's available here at the Naval Academy, even though I've been here since 2002, um, it's great to be on a panel with our colleagues and neighbors from the Naval Institute and the USNA Museum. So I'm going to start with uh, talking about the Nimitz Library, which uh, if you would go ahead and just move us to the next slide. So the Nimitz Library uh, is really just kind of the next building over. If you haven't been over to, to our library, uh, we hope that you will come by. I know uh, uh, Colonel Siskel gave us a shout out this morning and his remarks uh, following the opening keynote. And um, I just want to uh, reiterate that we we are open uh, today and tomorrow until 2200. Um, so if you find yourself um, with a few spare moments, we hope that you'll come over and uh, take a look at the library and um, see what we have over there. Um, our building opened in 1973, so as a as a facility um, at that time, it really combined holdings uh, that were pre-existing here at the Naval Academy in a number of different locations. So there was actually a brigade library that uh, uh, was housed over in Mitcher Hall. There was a library up in Mahan in the Heart Room where you registered and. Uh, maybe grabbed a cup of coffee this morning, and there was also a, other collections housed in, I believe, Isherwood and some other buildings that no longer exist here that were demolished um, when Alumni Hall was built. So uh, Nimitz was really um, an opportunity to bring all of these uh, somewhat dispersed collections together into one building, as well as provide a facility that um, you know, it was going to serve the needs of the midshipmen and faculty going forward. And uh, those are some of the images from, from about the time that the library opened. And uh, you can see the, the rather massive card catalog in one of those images, uh, which uh, went away before I got here in 2002. I want to say that probably uh, disappeared sometime in the mid-1980s, so you won't still find that there. But if you walk around, you will, in fact, still find a few pieces of the original furniture uh, furnishings that are scattered about the building. We just completed a major 
renovation um, of our main floor. Essentially, one half, the whole back half of the main floor of Nimitz Library was uh, underwent a approximately year and a half major renovation um, to uh, basically take what was uh, staff workspace, uh, cataloging acquisitions, operations, which have um, kind of uh, shrunk over the last you know, 15, 20 years, uh, and turn that space over to basically the, the patrons or midshipmen. Um, so that just finished up at the end of August. In fact, we're still uh, awaiting a few sort of uh, final touches on that renovation. But uh, I think if, even if you've been in the library within the last few years, uh, if you haven't been in them in the last few weeks, I can assure you that it's going to look quite a bit different once you walk in the front door. So one question we get, uh, particularly from, from folks that are not a part of the USNA uh, operations or community is, you know, what sort of access do we provide? And so um, we do uh, allow, um, you know, outside researchers uh, to come in and make use of the general collection. Um, there's various uh, policies and procedures for, uh, you know, if you're going to be doing long-term research within the Nimitz collection, you can uh, contact our library director, uh, Mr. Larry Clemens, and he can work with you um, to be able to set that up. But the hours are pretty extensive. Um, as you can see, 0700 to um, 1800, Monday through Friday, and then um, some pretty long hours on the weekends as well. And as I tell the midshipmen, uh, you know, the Nimitz Library, uh, they always ask what our hours are. And I say, well, the easiest way to remember it is we are open every single day from now until the last day of final exams, which is for this semester is roughly, I think, uh, December 22nd. Or something. Yeah, we're open every single day with the exception of home football game Saturdays, <laughs> uh, because there aren't very few midshipmen who would be available to even come in, uh, and Thanksgiving Day. Uh, we are open every other day, including uh, those upcoming federal holidays. And that, that's for the general Nimitz Library. Um, so our hours will vary. Um, I've got a little you know, fine print on there. Obviously, during COVID, the library was closed entirely uh, for a period of time, so you always want to check our website. But by and large, we are very much uh, open and available for you to be able to come in, uh, even without a USNA affiliation. We just ask that you sign in as a visitor. If you come over in the next day or two, um, you'll see a sign asking you to sign in, but uh, more than likely, if you go to the desk and say, hey, I'm just here for the Naval History Symposium, I want to take a look around, Though the, I doubt they're going to require you to sign in because usually that sign in is is intended only for folks who are going to be in there for an extended period of time doing research. So I like to talk a little bit about what we have over there in minutes and and throw some stats at you. Uh, the number I generally uh, you know throw out to midshipmen when they when they ask, well, gee, how many books are here? I say, uh, you know. A little more than half a million, which kind of shocks a lot of them. <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a pretty big number in their head as far as uh, you know the general collection of books that are in the Nimitz Library. Um, these numbers are constantly changing, but I just wanted to give you some idea of where we stand um, currently, or at least as of a year ago, and then the kind of transactions that we do, just how many uh, visitors we get, faculty, staff, midshipmen, uh, outside um, folks coming in and out, uh, you know, our circulation. And then the uh, chart that you see to the right there, uh, I decided to add this because one thing I hear a lot as I'm talking to library colleagues at other institutions or just other, other folks is, oh, well, the Naval Academy, that's, that's an engineering school. Uh, well, yes, <laughs> but um, if you look at this uh, chart, and I may, know it may be a little bit difficult to see, um, but the pie chart actually shows the actual percentage of shelf space dedicated to different subjects or disciplines. In the red section there um, is 
what is represented for humanities and social science disciplines. So our history collections, political science, economics, um, those make up the bulk of that. And I would say, you know, history is probably uh, the largest proportion of that humanities and social sciences. So yes, to some extent, we are an engineering tool, um, but as far as the print holdings of the library and literally the number of linear feet or shelf space that uh, we house subject materials, um, you can see it's substantial for history. And the easiest way that you can find out what we have is simply by going to the library's website. Uh, the very first thing that'll come up is a, a kind of a general search box called Nimitz Search. You don't need to be on the yard or have any special login to be able to type in a search for an item and see if we have it. Uh, so you can determine pretty easily just by going to our website um, from anywhere uh, what it is that we have available in terms of the circulating book collection as well as the journal holdings. We have uh, plenty of uh, article research article databases, many of which I know you are all familiar with as far as JSTOR, Project Muse, American History and Life, Historical Abstracts. So those um, secondary source article databases are things that we subscribe to have for a long time. And we do have uh, computers, terminals available in the library for non-USNA uh, individuals to be able to come in and use. So uh, I, I encourage you, if you don't otherwise have access to an individual account to some of these resources, and let's just say that you know the public library, in a lot of cases, that's not uh, something they would necessarily have available for their community, uh, for their users. You can come into Nimitz during our open hours, and there are computers that are available for you to be able to, you know, basically sit down and start using without any special permission or login, which is nice. I'll talk a little bit about the primary source research databases that we have. Um, there's honestly really too many to mention. But if you go to our website, again, um, you can actually take a look and just pull up a list of all of the different databases that we have. And there's a way to filter by type, um, which you can see in the, the sort of red rectangular box there is a drop down. So when you go to the list of databases from our homepage, you can actually click on that uh, drop down and you can select primary source. And as a type, currently we have 49 different primary source databases. And in fact, I would argue we have probably two or three times as many. It's just many of those are embedded as modules within some of the major um, resources such as History Vault or Adam Matthew, where uh, once you click into that, you'll find we have 10 or 12 or 20 different modules available within there. Um, so it gets a little bit complicated, as, as you might imagine. But uh, you know, certainly there are librarians there uh, on duty uh, during the day and into the evening to assist you. We have librarians on staff every day except Saturdays. And that number is constantly changing. And I like to think that it's it's steadily going up, which is good um, as our, you know, uh, it, it's a funding issue, obviously. Uh, but I think, you know, we in the last year or two, we were in the low 40s. We're now 49. I can't wait to see us get above 50. So some unique holdings that are just available in the stacks for you to go wander about and browse um, more than 1,400 individual cruise books uh, dating back to roughly the, the 1930s. Um, lots of different USNA publications, and I don't want to steal Dr. Brian's thunder, but um, we do have uh, access to fairly complete collections of things like the USNA yearbook, the Lucky Bag, um, the Log, 
um, the proceedings. And again, I won't steal your thunder as well with the, at the Naval Institute, but uh, just as a, as a place you can come and access those, um, there's an awful lot that you can find. Uh, Naval, Navy Department annual reports, uh, Bureau of Shipping publications, um, you know, pretty extensive, com I would say almost complete with perhaps only a few gaps, collections of things like Brassie's annual, the Royal Navy list, the Navy register, um, the Blue Jackets manual back to 1904. So if you're interested in, let's say, looking at how that has evolved over time, I know a lot of these things have been digitized but um, you know, you're actually going to be much more efficient, as I tell the midshipmen, being able to work with the paper copies on mass than you will trying to work with these things uh, in digital format. So those are the types of things you can find, particularly up on our third deck in the V's, um, James fighting ships, Navy annual reports, and um, you know, things that are probably very few libraries would ever have bothered to have the print copy of, and one example, you know, Navy Department court-martial orders uh, back to the 1920s and 30s um, that are published volumes that, uh, you know, probably are a little more obscure, but just sit on our shelves uh, within the open stacks. So I'll move on. So how can you get help or contact us? Well, certainly I've mentioned a number of times our website is a great place to go just to begin to access what we have and find out what our hours are and pull up all of our different contact information. Uh, so, uh, you know, take a look at that website. You can send email simply to askref at usna.edu and that's an account that's uh, continually monitored. So um, you're certainly welcome to email me if you have questions that you think I may be able to assist with, but um, the benefit of the ask ref is if I'm on leave for a week or two, I may not be able to get back to you, but the librarians who are in charge of that account um, can usually respond, uh, you know, within either same or next day. And we still answer the phone at our research help desk uh, when we're there, or you can leave a voicemail message. And the newest thing we have available to get in touch with us is actually a chat service. So if you're on our website, there's actually a uh, box there that says need help, which will kind of prompt you if you have any a desire to connect with a librarian. And the librarian you're talking to is actually one, one of the librarians at Nimitz Library. So it's not somebody, you know, in another location or who's who we're contracting that out to. It's actually Nimitz librarians who are um, staffing that particular chat service. And these are those other librarians, myself and my colleagues. Uh, there's eight of us who currently make up uh, membership of the research and instruction department. And um, next slide. We actually specialize in the different departments here at the Naval Academy. So that our model is what you would call a reference bibliographer model. So if you're you know, looking for uh, information or have questions on the history aspect, you can certainly get in touch with me but if you have questions for engineering or one of the other areas, uh, naval and military studies, there are librarians who are assigned and subject matter experts in those areas as well. I think this is my last slide. Yes, so I, I thank you very much. I look forward to your questions and I'm anxious to hear what the other folks are gonna share with us today. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Jennifer. Here we go. All right. So I'm going to talk about, obviously, the Special Collections and Archives Department, which is on the third floor of Nimitz Library. You're seeing a photograph of the reading room. Until the construction of Hopper Hall, we had a wonderful view of the Severn River from the uh, reading room, which now we look into the side of Hopper Hall. Uh, we, we still have a little bit of a view of the river, but uh, it's not, not quite the same. So the Special Collections and Archives Department it didn't exist until the library was opened in 1973. So much of what is in the collections either came out of the general collection of the library or uh, happened to be uh, material that was donated to the library. But next slide, please. 
So the archives, the William W. Jeffries Memorial Archives, which is named after William Jeffries, who was professor of history here at the Academy, and the uh, first archivist of the Academy, uh, the William W. Jeffries Memorial Archives is one of nine affiliated archives of the National Archives and Records Administration. So we actually are responsible for a federal record group, that's Record Group 405, Records of the United States Naval Academy. They do belong to the archives. The Academy has a memorandum of agreement with the National Archives whereby uh, the records are theirs, but the Academy is responsible for providing access to them maintaining them and providing staff. So uh, my one colleague uh, had a way of describing it because sometimes even people here at the academy don't quite understand. So uh, it's sort of like thinking of the bank branch in the supermarket. So <laughs> he used to work in the bank. So, that's <laughs> uh, so of course, these are the official records of the Naval Academy. So there would be things like the superintendent's correspondence, uh, Commandant's instructions and orders, uh, the midshipman regulations, uh, also the yearbook is considered an official record. You can also find that in the library's general collection, but obviously we keep it as an official record. And one of the things that to keep in mind is that some of the material does have Privacy Act restrictions. So, for example, we have all of the midshipman records in the in the uh, Naval Academy archives, but because of an agreement with the Department of Defense and the National Archives, those records are not open to the public until 62 years after the person's separation from service. And interestingly enough, we had a midshipman who, when he was a plea, wanted to look at Jimmy Carter's record. And when he was a plea, Jimmy Carter's record was still covered by the 62-year restriction. By the time he was a first-class midshipman, that restriction no longer applied. And that midshipman remembered that, and he came back <laughs> and looked at Jimmy Carter's record. So that is the archive. Next slide, please. Special collections uh, is, of course, what the name implies, special collections. And I know all of you are familiar with what kinds of things you find in special collections. Uh, we have about 30,000 volumes. This includes periodicals as well as separate monographs. Uh, we also have thousands of photographs. We don't really know how many photographs because between the archives and special collections, there are there probably tens of thousands uh, just because of the volume of material that's uh, obviously the number of photographs that are taken for events on the yard, especially in the digital age. And then of course, the, all the photographs that we have in special collections, including 3,000 combat pho photographs taken by Edward Steichen's photography unit during World War II. We also have seven in Cunabula. You might not think of the Naval Academy Library as having seven early printed books, or uh, might be something that uh, wouldn't occur to you. Uh, also, as Michael mentioned, all the subject areas in the library's general collection, those, of course, are represented in special collections as well. As I said, many of the books came from the library's general collection. And interestingly enough, we probably have three quarters of the books that were in the library prior to the Civil War. There was a Civil War, uh, there was a catalog published in 1860, in June of 1860, a printed catalog of the library's collections. And going through that, uh, I made an effort to pull whatever was still left in the general collection and the special collections, because many of these obviously are 19th century books and not necessarily particularly rare. But given that they had been in the library for over 150 years, it seemed like maybe they should all be together in special collections. I don't know, somebody who follows me might decide that's not a good thing. But, <laughs> uh, but anyway, so, so it, was, it was very surprising to me that there were about 75% of the books still here. Many of them in their original bindings, the, the bindings that the government paid to have them put in. And we have an oceanography class right now over in the special collections who's looking at uh, the display of, of, of books related to oceanography, and among those is a two-volume work on meteorology that still has the bindings on them that they had in the 1850s. So I tell the midshipmen, either they were uh, very well cared for, or the midshipmen didn't really use them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I think, I think that's all for that. Uh, next slide, please. 
I took a slightly different tag from Michael. I'm sort of going to go through just to show you how you can access resources uh, in the Special Collections Department. Our material is accessible off the yard. Uh, that is, our digital material and our finding aids are accessible from anywhere. There's no restrictions on access to that. So you're seeing the main page of the library. So you'll see at the top the search box that Michael mentioned. Uh, you can restrict to Special Collections and Archives by using the drop-down menu. You also see the icon for the archives and also on the left-hand navigation, a link to Special Collections and Archives. So if you go to uh, select either the archives icon or that left-hand navigation, that will take you to the department's main page. Next slide, please. And you'll see the, on the uh, left there again, navigation buttons. The, uh, how to use, how to research the manuscripts and researching archives and primary sources, those are more intended for the midshipmen. Obviously, all of you would know how to do that. <laughs> so I'm just going to focus on uh, our finding aid. So if you were to select the archives, uh, the archive collection button, next slide please, that'll take you to a list of the finding aids for the, what we call entries, which are actually the series within RG405. And so you will get a listing of those. You see that you can limit the buttons across the top. You can, you can just search superintendent or commandant, or you can go through all of them. And you'll find that uh, all of these are linked. Underneath the link is a brief description. If you click on the link, next slide please. That's a little small, and it's a little bigger on here, but then you get the finding aid for that particular entry, which is typical of, of finding aids. I'm sure all of you are familiar with that. So next slide, please. There you can see, and of course, the uh, contents list. Uh, Samuel Limnios is the assistant archivist, so he is responsible for processing, arranging, describing the entries within RG405, and he also, uh, we have, obviously, because of our affiliated status, uh, we work with uh, NARA. They, uh, to accession material and that sort of thing. So that's that's his job. Next slide, please. So taking you back to the home page, I didn't I didn't know how we were doing the slides. So, <laughs> um, so if you click the manuscript button, next slide, then you will get an alphabetical list of our manuscript collections. And now there are uh, finding aids for almost all of the processed manuscript collections. I think there are very few that don't have a finding aid. So again, you see a brief description, and then of course the title is linked to a finding aid. And I chose to uh, go with R. So if you pick the, the hit the next slide, there's the Roni papers. Uh, he actually was a very early graduate of the academy. He was in, in the 1840s. Uh, was related to David Bailey Warden, if any of you are familiar with Warden. And uh, there are actually happen to be about, I think there's something like seven or eight letters in this collection of Eliza Custis Law, who was George Washington's, um, <clears throat> was Martha Washington's granddaughter. And uh, anyway, the thing that's interesting about that to me is this, because of course my colleagues know that I'm a big George Washington fan. So when I knew that there were Eliza Custis Law letters, like, ooh, that's great. So. Uh, but anyway, so you know, you get the typical finding aid. Next slide, with the biography, the links to the contents list. Next slide, and of course, you'll see the um, the contents. Next slide, please. We also have digital collections. Again, these are accessible uh, to anyone off the yard. As I mentioned, that we have 3,000 combat photos from Steichen's photography unit. We have digitized about a thousand of those. We also have, which I think you can see, well, if you go to the next, uh, next slide, please. So on the left there, you'll see a link to Trireme. This is also a digital collection. This was something that was jointly sponsored with the Postgraduate School and the Naval War College. Actually, the Naval War College originally spearheaded this. The Naval Academy is the only uh, still contributing partner, so I don't know if that, if there's a I know there's triremes and biremes. I don't know what the unireme. Uh, <laughs> so, so, uh, but we do contribute to that. So that's where we put the archival records. Uh, the advantage, this is Preservica, is the um, company. And uh, the advantage to that is that uh, things can be walled off. So we can put things in there for archival purposes as, as in per permanent preservation. 
our digital face at the moment, our uh, digital uh, collections face is Content DM. We are changing to Alma. We just got a new integrated library system. So what I show you here today might not actually look this way uh, in January, but at least uh, you'll know that we do have digital material. So next slide, please. So we have a variety of things. You would select something, get drop-down menus. Uh, next slide. Uh, I focused on buildings and grounds. You can browse all of them. You can look at certain sections. So typically, uh, you've all seen these kinds of systems. You get thumbnails. Next slide, please. Uh, and then if you want the individual picture, you get the description and the photograph. These are downloadable. You can enlarge them and so forth. Next slide, please. We also have a blog. Uh, this is something that uh, we try to put things in there that promote the department's collections. So uh, the, all of the material in there comes from special collections and archives and uh, any resources we use, uh, many of them either come from the department itself or from the library, in which case uh, the call numbers are there so that if the midshipmen wanted to look up the book, assuming the midshipmen even pay attention to the blog, which they might not, but... <laughs> um, and it's something, so we all contribute to that. So you'll find a variety of information in there. Next slide, please. Also, one thing that might be of interest to you is the interactive map that uh, Sam Limnios created for the 175th anniversary of the Naval Academy. You have the modern map with the, the I think it's an 1876 map underneath, and the little pinpricks if you click on those, they'll take you to the photograph. And he made a, a very concerted effort to make sure that everything is facing the way that it would if you were standing there. So it's a really, really a great piece of work and something that um, actually the Public Affairs Office featured on its website during the 175th. But, well, you know, because of last last year's weirdness. There wasn't a whole lot going on, but in October was the uh, anniversary. <laughs> so next slide, please. Uh, there you see, maybe not too well, our hours. We're more limited, of course, than the uh, library's hours. So we're open Monday through Friday, by appointment only, 8 to 12. And you can walk in 12.30 to 16.30. We are closed on federal holidays and weekends. So typical of special collections and archives departments. Uh, if you want to make an appointment, uh, you'll see it's uh, my phone number up there or my email. Uh, usually email is a better way to get in touch with me just because I'm not frequently, I'm infrequently in my office, so the phone will probably just go to voicemail. Uh, you also see the uh, general number for reference questions. And I should mention my, I mentioned Sam Limnio the assistant archivist. David D'Onofrio is the Special Collections Librarian. He is responsible for the manuscript collections. And Adam Minikowski, whose picture also happened to be on Michael's slide because he works half-time for uh, research and instruction, works half-time for Special Collections and Archives. Uh, in addition to reference, he is responsible for doing the book cataloging. So I look forward to any questions you may have. And uh, that's, that's it for me. <laughs> Thank you. Sarah, you're up. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sarah Malone. I'm the managing director of the museum, which I'm now realizing I didn't put our hours up anywhere in any of these slides. But <laughs> sorry okay. about that. We're open um, every day except for Tuesdays and federal holidays, which is a slight change post COVID. And we're located right over there, right, literally across the street. So hopefully sometime during this um, symposium, some of you will have some spare time to come poke around. We'd love to, love to have you. Um, and it's dry. It's very dry and warm and cozy. <laughs> um, so to start out, I just have a, uh, oh, sorry, next slide. Some quick facts about the museum. Um, so the Academy opened in 1845, as did sort of the, the museum. Um, it's, the museum today is a modern version of kind of an amalgam of various collections. So while the focus of the museum is on the history of the Navy and the Academy itself, we also have a wide range of artifacts from all across the globe and, and history and various um, 
subject matter. Um, one of our, our most prized collections is the Trophy Farm Repository in 1849. Um, Congress designated the Naval Academy Museum as the official repository for all trophy farms. Uh, in 1939, Trouble Hall was built, which is what is across the street now. Um, however, it's been added to and renovated. The most recent renovation uh, taking place in 2009. So, in addition to the flags, the collection has a very impressive um, ship model collection. So, our whole second deck, if you get a chance to come over, is devoted to ship models. I think it's probably one of the foremost ship model collections in the world. I, I understand in the UK and Sweden, there are some uh, ship model collections and museums remaining, but I also, from what I understand, they're not displaying as, as extensive a collection as ours. So we're pretty, pretty proud of that. Um, we have paintings, manuscripts, um, books as well. And that's just kind of the tip of the iceberg. Like I said, there's there's a little bit of everything um, over there across the street. Visitation, um, pre-COVID, we had over 100,000 visitors per year. There are 10 staff. And then we have a mighty volunteer corps. So we have the, our front desk volunteers, which are generally um, people with academy or Navy affiliations, passions, a lot of retirees who are wonderful to talk to in and of themselves. Um, the Monuments Nerds are a recent volunteer corps created by our educators, and they're made up of midshipmen. And they, they're working on all kinds of museum projects. And while they're still learning, they, they are actually great resources and great advocates for the museum as well. On um, Tuesday nights and or, sorry Thursday nights and Saturday mornings, we have a specific group of volunteers dedicated to working on the ship models. Um, and then finally, we also have a group of curatorial volunteers who, at the moment, are fairly dormant thanks to COVID, but they come and work on um, condition reporting and um, filing and cataloging artifacts and that kind of thing. So some of the services that the museum has to offer um, are, first and foremost, we pride ourselves in being a teaching museum. So it's kind of a unique category of museums in that we really want people to come in and be interactive with the staff and with the, with the collection. Um, there's a lot of uh, classes that are hosted in conjunction with our education department um, in the gallery spaces. We offer research support. Um, I know that, that Jennifer and Michael have talked a lot about finding aids. For us, our finding aids are generally our staff. Um, so it's, while we don't have the um, technological outreach component, we have the personal outreach component. So um, the connection to the collection would be through our staff who are wonderful and more than willing to help anyone with with a question or a project um, and it's amazing the inquiries that we get on a daily basis just from from the general public be they formal researchers or just enthusiasts uh, really anyone and everyone and, and we're happy to help um, we provide images of artifacts so um, Generally, we have a very limited number of photographs and images available to the general public online. So again, we're just a, a question away from providing uh, an image of any sort of artifact um, in our collection. Like I said, we focus on academy history. So that is going to be a big, um, a big we'll, we'll be a big source of information when it comes to, to the academy. Um, Classroom support and collaboration. Again, our, we have a, an educator and a historian in particular who are very enthusiastic and willing to support classroom efforts. Um, they'll feature artifacts. They can uh, speak on a wide range of subjects. They're knowledgeable um, and, and very willing to serve. 
we've recently reinvigorated our tour offering. So again, just a phone call or an email away if, if anyone has a group or a specific area of interest that we might be able to support. And then finally, our collections department um, is able to serve other typically formal um, museum entities with loans. So artifact loans, um, by agreement, um, paperwork, all that kind of good stuff. But it's kind of, it can be the lifeblood of museums in general, the ability to, to collaborate, exchange artifacts, and create exhibits with um, drawn from collections beyond what everyone has in their own attic. So I wanted to give a, an overview of the staff because, like I said, the staff is so integral to the um, the connecting with the artifacts and finding things. So we're, we're a staff of ten, led by Captain John Simon, who is also a, a history professor here at the academy. So he is the connection to the academy institution as a whole, establishes policy. Um, works with the foundation, promotes community relations, and in general, themselves on exhibits and programming, just the general operations of the museum. Uh, managing director, that's me. I manage the staff, the facilities, and kind of like in everyone's business about everything to a certain extent. <laughs> um, but trust me, the staff really needs very little guidance from me. Um, and our admin officer is Lorianne Tarver. So for those of you who are from the history department, you may know her. Um, she is the person that uh, does what an admin officer does and keeps things running, helps us all figure out how to do these ideas that we want to do. Uh, next slide. So these are gonna be the, this is like the meat of the wayfinding crowd. Um, for the museum. Our senior curator, Tracy Logan, has been with the museum. She's one of, she's not the longest tenured staff member, but she's been with the museum for quite a while. She's a jack of all trades, and she is great on advising um, territorially, but also content wise. She's probably Second, the second on our staff in terms of academy history. Um, and so she also leads the assessment process and um, oversees the territorial volunteers. Um, and what the assessment process is, is um, when we receive offers of donation or additions to our collection, we have a committee, we assess the objects, vote on them, and then decide if they're appropriate for the collection. So she's kind of the guide in that. Um, Grant Walker is another person that some of you Academy folks may know because he's been a face around here for many, many years. He is a fabulous uh, historian and researcher. He will uh, spend hours helping to answer a question or get to the bottom of the detail. He's also our photographer, so for those image requests that we receive, he is our go-to guy. He has a I have a little studio set up in our attic spaces. So if there's a need for a photograph to accompany a publication or something like that, that's where Dan comes in. Dan Rule is our ship model curator. And he is, he is a true artist and he's probably one of the top five, um, maybe even top three, I don't know, ship model curators in the world. Um, I really encourage you to come by to, to see some of his work if you were to enter the museum. Um, one of the tips in the main entry where you can ask the um, front desk volunteers to point you in that direction. But he he is, is responsible for spending hours and hours of um, applying just expertise and meticulous detail to some of these amazing models. Um, and then he, he also hosts and the strip model volunteer program. Next slide. 
Our exhibit designer is Bill Rogers, kind of another jack of all trades. He is our one man show for um, building the exhibits, doing the electricals, um, construction, technology, um, anything like that. And then our collections management team is made up of two people, Jennifer Nicholas and Dan Rocchio, and they are uh, the people responsible for those 60 plus thousand objects, caring for, um, storing, cataloging, everything. It's kind of a mind-boggling task. Um, and then last but not least, is our education specialist, Sandra Duplantis, who is also kind of a known quantity over here. She, for those of you who are local, she has the, the dog, the service dog, Biggie. Um, and she is like an endless font of energy and enthusiasm for naval history. Uh, midshipmen, um, history in general, she's a veteran. Um, she, she really could not be a more welcoming presence for, in terms of being one of those human finders of things. Um, so she hosts a lot of the tours, she hosts a lot of the classes, and if anyone has a research question or even a midshipman um, is looking for an appropriate research topic, she is the, she's the gal. Next slide. So this is just a little slide that I made up because I was thinking if I, what I would need to see if I was someone who had no idea how to make use of a museum. Um, um, sorry, so it starts with you on the left. And then, like I said, reaching out to the museum staff via email, phone, you can come visit. Uh, or our website, and then sort of the resources that we have to, to offer. This is just a short list, and it looks long, but we have artifacts, session files, everything you see there, like um, Jennifer and Michael said, we've got the lucky bag. Um, not only do we have our formal collection of the sessioned artifacts, which like most museums is like a no touch um, kind of thing we have, a research collection. So we have um, photos, letters, documents, copies of things that you can hold and use and um, look through catalogs, um, log books, manuscripts, everything that you see there. Um, I think most of that is self explanatory. However, the last two I will speak specifically to. Um, Jim Seavers was our kind of historian, curator, managing director. He just sort of did everything for 50 years with the museum. And so when he retired, a lot left with him. But he did do a meticulous, often meticulous job of filing and documenting. So his personal files are also a great resource to us um, and to everyone. Furthermore, he's, he's still out there. So we try not to call him, <laughs> but he's like the ultimate wayfinder of anything. Um, and he can't be replaced. And then finally, NHHC stands for the Naval History and Heritage Command. This museum is one of 10 uh, Navy museums located around the country with different areas of expertise. There's undersea, there's TV, aviation, American sailor, for enlisted um, submarines. So there's a whole breadth of um, specialty museums within the NHHC family. And our museum and our staff can help anyone get access to, to those museums, the staff there, their collections, um, the NHHC website is is a good resource for doing research as well. So, if anyone um, isn't aware of of that, then please definitely look look for it and make use of it. And then, next slide. This is just the getting started page. So certainly come visit us. 
um, if, if you have access to the Academy internet, we are all uh, listed in there if you want to reach out to us directly. However, if you don't, you can just call the front desk um, phone and they're great at passing anyone through to any one of us. And then finally, we have a whole variety of email addresses that the staff manages collectively as a group and um, whoever is going to be the right person for it ends up responding to whatever question you have. And that is it for me. And last but not least, Janet. Unfortunately, I don't have any slides, <laughs> but I do have a handout that I prepared with basic information. Uh, can you? Go ahead and get started, yeah. Okay, uh, I hope many of you are familiar with the Naval Institute. Uh, most of you should be familiar with our magazines, Proceedings, and Naval History. Um, we also have a library at our headquarters in Beach Hall, which is directly across from the cemetery. Uh, we're, a very, we're a small special subject library. We're on the third floor of Beach Hall, and um, our holdings are all related in some way to the sea services. And while we try to put all Naval Institute books into our library, we also have other reference books and major historical documents that um, are included. So we have a pretty good research library over there. Um, the Naval Institute is an independent nonprofit entity. We date back to 1873. We were founded here at the Naval Academy in what was the chemistry building at that time. It would have been at the end of Maryland Avenue. Our library includes thousands of books on Naval topics. We have complete set of proceedings, magazines, and uh, if you have a Naval Institute membership, you have free virtual access to our entire set of proceedings uh, articles going back to 1873. Um, if you don't have a membership, I encourage you to get one. Uh, the virtual memberships are very reasonable and certainly a good value. If we also offer, we have a full set of Naval History magazine, which is a wonderful uh, resource and um, the beautiful uh, magazine in print. Um, one of the jewels of our collection is our oral history collection. We're very proud of it. It started in the 1960s with Dr. Mason, who was an oral history historian from Columbia University, came down to the Naval Institute and um, did some wonderful work for us. Our oral history collection, I think, is one of the best. Um, certainly, the Navy doesn't do their own oral histories, so um, they, I think, were the best collection of oral histories. They're, they're thoroughly vetted. Um, they take the entire career of individuals. Uh, so they're not short oral histories. They're, they're long they're in, and they're in-depth. Um, they have all been digitized. Uh, the tapes, the original tapes, have been digitized and they are available for licensing for any documentary films uh, that you are working on. Um, and they are, um, the transcripts are also digitized and available um, 
we can put them on a, a USB drive and mail them to you. Unfortunately, we can't put them online right now because there's many different copyright restrictions on them. Um, we also maintain a vast collection of sea service photographs. I think we have over 400,000 photographs in our collection. Uh, we have, uh, it includes like the academies, um, aircraft, a vast aircraft select collection, a very large combat collection. Um, we, we have a second uh, photographs as well. We have vessels of U.S. and um, foreign ships. We have a very large collection of Soviet ships. We have um, a large collection of individuals as well. So it's a great resource for authors to illustrate books. Um, if you're publishing with the Naval Institute Press, you have access to all the photographs for free. Um, if you're an outside publisher, we can license them to you for a very reasonable price too. Um, our photograph collection is currently being digitized. I think we're up to 150,000 digitized. Um, we're working on getting the metadata for every single photograph. That includes copyright information provenance, um, captioning, um, might point out little details of the photo that aren't in the caption. So we have two digital archivists over there that are working pretty hard on it. And we have a digital asset management system that right now is internal. But what it does for us is it, the way it's cataloged, if you're searching on a particular topic, you can see the books, you can see the articles, you can see the photographs, all by searching with a keyword. Or you can go in and say you only want to look at a certain um, certain type of asset, like photographs. You could just look at photographs. So this is something that's internal, but if you visit us in person or if you contact us as researchers, we can do the research for you virtually and. Um, asset, you know, we have access to, to everything in our collection. Right. Now, if you go to our website and see the photographs, that's just a small collection of what we have. Because like I said, most of, most of this is internal at this point. If you're working on a book or an article and you want to see certain photographs, you can give us a wish list. We can put them in a portal so that you can look at them and then just say which ones you're interested in using. We're open during normal weekday business hours. Um, during uh, COVID-19, we're kind of on a hybrid schedule. Everyone is uh, not in the office on Fridays. We're working from home on Fridays, but the best way to reach us is probably by email. And you can reach me at my personal email, which is jjorgensen at usni.org. That might be hard to remember, but remembering research at usni.org will go to me um, and to my assistant as well. Okay, So we encourage you to make an appointment if you're going to drop by. Uh, particularly because of this hybrid working schedule right now. And uh, we, we love to have visitors. We have the new Jack Taylor Conference Center, which is the grand opening is going to be at the end of the month. But if, you, if you're here now and you're curious and you want to take a look, come on over. Um, it's beautiful. It's state of the art. And it's available for 
conferences and events. And that's all I have. All right, thank you to all four of our presenters today. Um, we've got we've got about 35 minutes for questions and discussion here. So the way we'll do this is, as I mentioned at the start, for our virtual attendees, please remain muted. Use the Q&A function in your Google Meet in order to ask your question. I'll start with the in-person folks. We'll take two questions from in-person, and then I'll ask Ensign Bierman if we've got any questions from our virtual attendees. So. Please, any questions? Commander Armstrong, can you describe the FINS program a little bit more? Is that going to be accessible to outside researchers? So yeah, the FINS program is going to be accessible both, uh, you know, the focus at first is inside the walls here, but our intention is to reach out beyond the walls of the Naval Academy uh, in order to help support the wider naval history community. Um, I, I'm not going to go into it that much more because frankly, I want to focus on the, the research opportunities here, but I, I will just say, we're going to be launching this over the next couple of weeks. We'll get a website up. You'll hear more from us uh, in the coming weeks. Thank you. Right. Uh, tell me about your interlibrary loan policy. Will you send material to other academic libraries, say, George Mason University? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for example. Uh, so, as far as the Nimitz Library is concerned and items, that would be requested from the general stacks. Um, we routinely uh, loan materials via interlibrary loan to other libraries um, through those kind of formal channels. Um, occasionally, something is really uh, too fragile to loan out. We have things in the general collection that are boxed, and you know we we don't circulate them. To even to our own midshipmen or faculty. So those items, unfortunately, might come back as not loanable. But in general, most things in the, in the collection, if, if we have it, we'll be able to send it. So. Okay, we're going to move to see if we have any online questions, Mr. Okay. Behrman. Uh, yes, sir. The first question is from Eugene G. He asks, what facilities are available to copy print materials or download digital materials? So I think that question, uh, we could start with Michael and then maybe Janice also. So um, we are actually, I want to say in the last, it was earlier this week that we were setting up a, a digital scanner uh, in the library, um, kind of, next generation photocopier, I guess you could call it. So if um, people would like to make copies of items from the print collection, whether that's you know um, pages from a book or from uh, a magazine or whatever we have, that equipment is, uh, I, I can't assure you that it's up and running today because literally we just installed it uh, earlier this week. Um, and then as far as um, downloading materials, that's depends on the resource that somebody would be using. Um, but you know, if they're if they're coming into Nimitz and they're getting on to one of those workstations that I mentioned is available to the public, uh, generally there's there's no issue with being able to download something and then attach it as an email. Unfortunately throughout BOD there is a prohibition on thumb drives, so that does present some problems for, for people as far as um, you know file storage. But generally the, the, e, the being able to download and attach it as a to an email is how most people are operating uh, in our library. And another remote question. Are there any others? Yes. Another is by Chris Madsen. He asks I am interested in Philip Alger, who was a math professor at the U.S. Naval Academy and uh, the secretary treasurer of the U.S. Naval Institute. He's translated several leading French naval theorists. What types of sources might I expect to find in Nimitz and U.S. NIP libraries? Dennis, you want to try and tackle that? Yeah, that's, that's interesting that you asked because um, I recently found out that he uh, wrote the general prize essay for the Naval Institute. 
Institute in 1903, which was never published in proceedings because of censorship. <laughs> and we didn't have a copy of it, so we'll, I... We'll shortly get it. <laughs> Do you have it? Yes, I, I got it. This is Andy Blackley. I got a copy of it. I got a yeah. copy of it from New York Public Library. I, was, so. I, I got it from Harvard. Oh, did you? <laughs> yeah, the only <laughs> libraries yeah. I found yeah. were Harvard, Yale, and okay. New York Public Library yeah. that had it. <laughs> but um, well, he wrote extensively for the Naval Institute, and we um, have articles um, that he wrote at the turn of the century. Um, and they are available to read online if you're a member. Now, if you're not a member, if you contact me, we'll, we'll make, um, we very often make an exception and are able to get a copy with all the, uh, that has the copyright restrictions on it and able to give it to you, especially if you're going to use it for academic purposes. Um, did I answer your question? <laughs> so, how about either maybe Michael or Jennifer, perhaps, could also address this from the Nimitz perspective? Well, we do have records for the mathematics department, so it's possible that there would be information about him that would appear in there. Uh, we also have records on individual faculty members, so he might show up in that, and also um, could show up in just in, in the superintendent's correspondence. So it would take some searching through the records. And uh, as Sarah mentioned, even though we, uh, with the Special Collections Archives, we have all sorts of finding aids online. Also, the staff are uh, often your best entry into particularly the archival records. Thank you very much. I want to add, uh, you reminded me, we do have um, the handwritten um, records from the beginnings of the Naval Institute, and I'm sure that there's many entries in there uh, that might be of interest, but you have to visit the Institute to actually access uh, those records. Thank you. And as an Alger nerd myself, <laughs> he was William Sims's roommate here at the Academy, <laughs> and his man on the inside of the Bureau of Ordnance during the continuous aim fire today. So a really fascinating figure, Chris. I'm glad you're working on it. Uh, okay, so questions from the in-person audience. In the back row. Brian, thank you very much. Uh, what's your policy on digital photography and the public collections? Do you take pictures of it? Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, if you, you can use your phone, um, you can use a digital camera. Uh, we even, on occasion, if you want to have a more elaborate setup, we'll, we'll allow that. But yeah. So it is allowed. It's, it's been actually great for the midshipmen. So. Anybody else? Sir. Additionally, on the uh, archival slash special collections, if we are uh, interested in getting access to those records, how much uh, lead time would you like, et cetera, for well, the process for coming? Well, if you're a mid, if you're a mid, you send me an email at like 10 o'clock at night asking for an 8 o'clock appointment. <laughs> 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 Since you're not a midshipman. <laughs> I mean, we usually can accommodate if you give us 24 hours notice. Um, you know, obviously, if you're coming from a distance, you might want to have a little bit more lead time. But there's very rarely uh, are there any conflicts or reasons we couldn't. Uh, this morning is what would be one of those rare conflicts because we have two oceanography classes having their library instruction in our room. So otherwise. Okay. Remote questions. Uh, this one from Jessica Irwin asks, does anyone on the panel have a list of underutilized collections that you are hoping researchers uh, could use or explore? If, if so, is that list published? Great question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave this up to anybody. What, what should we be looking at, folks? All of them. I mean, that, I would say, uh, I mean, we certainly advertise as much as possible by having our finding aids accessible. And I had, um, I did a podcast with Paul Barabee, the previous museum director, just on special collections and archives, and he asked me what was underutilized in the collections. And I said to him, well, that was very hard to say, but I think 
And obviously here at the Naval History Conference, I might show up my ignorance, but as again, my specialty is colonial revolutionary America. So. But uh, it seems to me that we have a number of ship's logs and journals that relate to the Navy on the, uh, in the South American waters. And I don't know that a lot has been written on that topic. And obviously a lot of midshipmen would have been involved in that, you know, so before the Spanish-American War. So that seems like an area that might be underutilized. Anybody else? Um, I mentioned it in, in my portion. The cruise books, I think, are an interesting and unique uh, resource that uh, I think somebody could do some really interesting work with. And as far as their, their cultural and historical significance of those items, um, I have one that I usually show in some of the history classes that I work with. It, it's the cruise book from the USS San Jacinto from 1944. And it's actually a pretty, pretty thin, uh, you know, one of the smaller cruise books we have. And I asked them, well, you know, what, what do you think is significant about this particular cruise book? And I, I get a lot of, you know, nodding of heads and sort of, I don't know, what, what is it? And then I show them that, well, you know, uh, Lieutenant George H.W. Uh, Bush is listed in here. So he was a Navy pilot. That was his ship that he was aboard when he was shot down uh, over Chichijima during World War II. And, you know, he survived, but his two fellow crew members did not. And so, you know, they're like, well, that's now that now I'm interested, right? <laughs> so this, this cruise book is kind of going to tell you something about the time that, um, George H.W. Bush spent on that ship as a young Navy pilot, who his fellow crewmates were, uh, where did they go, what did they do, um, in a, a kind of detail that is probably not going to show up in too many other places or sources. So that's just one example of the sort of thing that I think of, you know, that's just kind of sitting on the shelves and, and people can come across it. So, so I'll, I'll just kind of chime in on this question a little bit because but frankly, it's the reason why I put this panel together, because I do think the resources, every time I engage with any of these four collections, I am blown away with what's available and has been completely untouched. Um, many times it's simply people failing to come to Annapolis and look. Um, so we, we need to advertise it better, I think it's part of it. Uh, but I'll give an example from my own research. You know, I was working on the War of 1812 and undersea warfare in the War of 1812. Uh, what then were called torpedo operations, or we call mine warfare today, most folks don't realize that really the first significant operations using mines in American naval history are, are in the War of 1812, largely driven by Robert Fulton, who we know for his steam power rather than his weapons design. But so Fulton had this, this uh, tactical manual, for lack of a better description, that he wrote on how to use a mine. In 1813, the uh, Congress passed a law that said any American who sinks a British warship will get half the value of that warship and half the value of the military stores on board the warship. So if you're talking about a British 74, you're talking about a fortune, right? Um, and, and Congress passes this bounty law basically called the Torpedo Act. And Fulton offers anybody who wants to sign a contract with him a deal. He'll give them the weapons and he'll give them a tactical manual. And they promise to give them half of what they earn. <laughs> and there's actually several of these contracts that exist in the records still. There, there's one at the University of Indiana that's absolutely fascinating to read through the contract. It's explicit. It's like, what happens if the attacker dies in the attack? How much money goes to his wife, to his son? It's a very explicit contract. And so these contracts appear in the literature, this event appears in the literature, the tactical manual, I couldn't find referenced anywhere other than the fact that it existed. Until one day after then, then director of the museum, Claude Barabay's invitation, I was spending some time up in the attic in the museum, going through the Fulton papers, and there it was, all 14 handwritten pages of it, right? And I just happened to be there looking for Fulton-related stuff, and boom, here's that document, and it's a fascinating read. 
It's a straight up tactical manual. How do you dress? What time of night do you go? Uh, how many dead pigs and chickens do you put in the boat so you can pretend to be a market boat? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's detailed. And, and there it was simply because I happened to be looking. And so I think, you know, that little story is an illustration of the fact that there's a lot here inside these walls. Uh, but we all just kind of need to come look. All right, so we'll go for another in-person question if anyone has one. I don't have a question, but I'll share another experience, BJ. Sure. I, can. I recently was researching the United States Naval Academy during the Civil War. I went to the Nimitz Special Collection and had access to letters written by midshipmen. One had written a letter to his sister in which he said things like, your penmanship is getting much better. So that apparently was important. But then he wrote a letter to his parents saying, we thought that we were going to be attacked last night. There were forces from Baltimore that moved to the northern side of the river. We were concerned that they were going to try to come and steal the Constitution. So I was woken in the middle of the night. We went to the armory, and I drew both a rifle, a pistol, and a sword and went out to defend the ship. And then four or five days later, I met with Sandra Duplantis, and she pulled out the logs from uh, the Constitution. And I was able to read about the very last formation on the pier where some of the midshipmen were dismissed and headed south to join the Confederacy. Then the ship got underway headed out to Annapolis Roads and unfortunately ran aground. <laughs> and then there was some effort to get her underway again and, and anchor her free. And then the, the youngsters were, were charged with standing those security watches before the rest of the brigade could embark and get underway. So it was fascinating that just I had no idea that any of those things were available. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that because I was actually just upstairs in, the, in our attic yesterday and I saw those Fulton um, documents, letters that you're talking about, but I think um, both of your points are well made that you started with with someone at the museum, and and I, I think I'm st certainly still learning, everyone is still learning what, what we have, um, but it's just a, a ton of super cool information. Um, so, you know, even Grant Walker, who, who's like the the guy to go to for research, he's still discovering new things. So um, certainly don't hesitate to just reach out to us and we'll go exploring together, find whatever you need. Other online questions? I did put in a question about prompt to answer any last minute questions, but I did not see any additional. Okay. I'll just, oh, we got a couple more. Sorry. Yep, I, I thought I'd jump in. Uh, and this question's for Janice, uh, uh, Naval Institute. Beach Hall, right? Have not been there. Uh, Ned Beach, uh, a phenomenal uh, naval officer and submariner. Do you have a lot of any of his papers or, or things related to that? Okay, talk to <laughs> <laughs> no, I, mean, I don't know what Janice does, but we, we have, yes, we have the papers. Okay, thank you. I think what we'll find with a lot of these collections is a lot of overlap because a lot of the people we're talking about are academy grads and naval institute writers and significant naval figures all in one and so you'll end up with part of their papers in one place and part of their papers on the other but also all inside the walls here so one place to come visit yeah and, yeah and one of the things to keep in mind is as i mentioned special collections and archives didn't exist as its own entity until 1973 when the library was open. So the reason you find a lot of manuscripts in the museum uh, is because there was no other place for them to go, so they would go to the museum. I mean, the library did have manuscripts, and it, usually the log books because they're bound volumes. But So if you just in case anyone's curious as to why there are manuscripts in the library and manuscripts in the museum. For our virtual friends, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A function on Google Meet. We are not going to take live questions from you. We're going to have Ensign Bierman read them out. Uh, so you mentioned the Fulton Collection. Is there a catalog to the Fulton Collection or a list of the letters and how far back it goes in his career? We do have some catalogs, yeah, of okay. manuscripts. Um, they were published years ago, but obviously they haven't changed. Um, so yeah, okay, 
Janice, I, I'm doing Civil War, and I do a lot of <clears throat> research at the NHAC and LOC on Civil War photographs. I was wondering, does your collection have much? Uh, yes, we, we have a lot of the vessels. Mm -hmm. um, and we do have uh, <coughs> prints of Princess Prince, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, also included sure. in the collection. Anything that we used in articles oh, okay. would come to us and be put into our photo. Well, would there be a big, big overlap with NHHC or uh, do you have uh, some things that they wouldn't have? We, uh, yes, <laughs> to <yes>. both <laughs> questions. <laughs> to both questions. What's working anyway? Right? Yes, it definitely is. Okay, thank you. Well, if you could remask, please. Yeah. Any other online questions come in? Okay. I was just gonna yeah. throw something out and just say that uh, you know I I certainly feel as though it it is my honor and privilege to be the current history librarian at Nimitz Library, but uh, and I and I will say I, I'm sure as a lot of people might that they feel like they have the best job at the Naval Academy, um, but I also stand on the shoulders of giants uh, to, a, to a large extent. So uh, I came here in 2002, but initially I was not the history librarian. I stepped into that role about five, six years ago when our previous uh, history librarian um, decided she was ready to retire. So, uh, you know, I had the, the wonderful experience of kind of, you know, being a colleague to somebody who had been here Quite a bit longer than me and so there was a, a, a lengthy sort of period of um, just you know kind of learning from her uh, from her knowledge her institutional knowledge of the library uh, as a collection and and what was in it and how she viewed collecting for Nimitz library for the subject uh, history subject area uh, and then kind of a transition and then kind of taking that over. And I think that's one of the wonderful things you get if you just come into the library and browse, you know, whatever call number area, whether it's the, the you know, World War II or American history or the, the, the naval uh, science uh, materials up on the third deck is you're kind of getting a, a, an experience of a curated collection of all kinds of material, you know, everything from, you know, 100 plus year old things that today we think of as primary source um, to the latest, you know, secondary source, you know, scholarly academic books that have been published and, and uh, purchased for the collection. So it's really that legacy um, that you're not really going to find anywhere else that I think is one of the true strengths of the Nimitz Library. And that's, that's something that's been built over decades and generations of librarians who I think we view ourselves as just kind of the temporary caretakers of that. And then, you know, I will pass that on at some point to whoever comes next. That, that, that previous librarian was Barbara Manville, who and I had a similar experience when I started working on my PhD. I went in to meet her. It was the year she was retiring. I went in to meet her in the library and she gave me the walkabout. Right, she took me through the whole collection, and I was blown away. Right? All this, all this plan, all these planned trips that I had to go to Nara didn't need to do because the <laughs> stuff was on microfilm in the basement of Nimitz. Um, and so, it, it really is an amazing collection. So, if there are no other questions from the audience, I'll just I want to offer our panelists a, a last thought or opportunity to, to have a last comment if you have anything. I just have one thing. Um, you asked about Ned Beach. We do have uh, a lot of his personal items in the um, display cases outside our boardroom on the third floor, right across from the library. Thank you. I would just say, um, please make use of all of the things that we have available. And if you wonder if there's something like Ned Beach's papers or any questions, uh, please direct them to us. We're always happy to assist researchers. Uh, just because if you don't see it online or in the catalog doesn't mean we don't have it. 
and, and just to echo that, uh, I was actually talking to a class of, um, you know, HH-104, which is our American Naval History Weeb, uh course here. And I, you know, was asking them for questions. One of the questions that came up was, sir, what do you think is the most, you know, sort of um, overlooked or underappreciated resource in the library? And I said, well, I'm probably a little biased, but I think it's the staff the people who work here, whose job it is to assist you. So we have a lot of great stuff, but I think as you've heard from all of the different panelists, um, you know, oftentimes the best resource are the people who are there day in, day out, and know that material like the back of their hand and can save you a tremendous amount of time and who are more than willing and happy to assist you with your research. So I encourage you uh, to take advantage of that. That would be a great place to end, except I think Glenn has figured out how to use the Q&A function on the <laughs> So I want to let him ask his question. Uh, yes, sir. His question was, uh, digital collections may not be deposited, uh, for example, communication. So how does one get to that avenue? So you're talking about at the which location? Um, so, it, so from the if you've joined us and uh, you missed earlier presentations, all of our presenters discussed how to get access to their collections. So this is being recorded and it will be posted later on. So you'll be able to go back and review what they said. But in essence, all three, you can just email their organization and they'll help you find access. Um, if it's not digitally available, how to come to Annapolis or how to contact them and see if they can do some remote research for you. Um, so I encourage you to, to review this panel session. It might take a couple of days for us to get the technology worked out and get it posted on YouTube, but that will be happening in the future. All right, and I wanna thank everybody for coming today. I feel like we had a great panel and thank you to our panelists. Absolutely. <laughs>